Okay, so every blessing to you all and welcome back to my walking talking pulpit and uh, for today if I may I want to discuss a subject of wickedness our Calvinist brethren refer to this as total depravity or total inability and uh, what they mean by that is before you got saved if you are saved of course you were dead in your sins completely dead spiritually dead without any hope whatsoever and the moment you got saved the Lord made you alive he literally gave you a new spirit and you went from being dead to being alive and yet before you got saved if you are saved you are referred to as being an enemy of the Lord that's right an enemy of the Lord in fact let me say this to you according to the scripture uh, John chapter 3 you've already been judged and not only found wanting but have been found guilty which means this that when an unsaved person dies they go straight to hell first death not the second death because they've been judged and found guilty and that's why we as preachers Patrick and I and others spend as much time as we can trying to get the gospel out speaking to people reasoning with people trying to explain how precious life is what does James say your life is like a vapor here today and gone the next in fact we know from statistics how 150,000 people die every day all over the world that's what 8,000 an hour and according to my Bible most people will die as they lived lost and go to hell forever and yet here's the key it doesn't need to be that way you have what's called a free will and if you want to you can be pardoned you can be saved that's the whole purpose of Christ coming to earth he literally came to earth lived the life that you and I couldn't live and died in our place and we refer to that as substitutionary atonement somewhat of a mouthful but it means this that someone who loves you very much did something for you someone literally paid the price for you if you want to try and look at that from a modern perspective I guess it's like this you have a debt on your home or on your car and you can't pay it and if you can't pay it you're going to be evicted lose your house or lose your car and then someone steps forward and says I will pay that person's debt for them I will clear the debt and you've got one or two options you either gratefully receive it or you arrogantly reject it that in a nutshell is the gospel the gospel of the grace of God Christ dying for our sins tasting death for every man and if you believe on him if you trust him he will save you and keep you saved so keep that in mind because that's the good news and that's something which those of us which are saved rejoice in in fact ask yourself this and I'm speaking to save people now when was the last time you thanked the Lord for your salvation when was the last time you thanked the Lord for your food or the air that you breathe simple things and yet as far as he is concerned major things but let's go back to the main theme for today's walking talking pulpit and let's take a look at wickedness and I've been saved 14 years and I'm seeing a great increase in the amount of lawlessness wickedness I'm watching and hearing and reading about more and more young people killing each other something unprecedented just a few years ago and yes there's always been sin and wickedness going right back to the first uh, book of the Bible Genesis chapter 4 concerning Cain and Abel and of course Cain killed his brother because he was jealous envious and the Lord received Abel's sacrifice being blood because there was life in the blood and yet his brother Cain brought the fruit of the ground something of an insult to the Lord 
So it's always been around, it's nothing new. And yet as we continue to get nearer to the second advent, we are seeing a greater increase in depravity, wickedness, evil. And this is why most people are gonna be damned. They already are in a spiritual sense, but upon death, if they don't get saved, they will perish and be damned in a literal sense. But like I say, I'm seeing a greater increase in wickedness and depravity. And I'm seeing it all around me. I'm thinking to myself, there are many reasons why this is occurring and almost doesn't seem to be uh, able to abound. It continues to spiral out of control. And I think the main reasons are that number one, we are living in a secular society. More and more families are unsaved. Parents are not uh, getting saved, not getting their children saved, and therefore their children are going astray. And yet I have heard some awful events of Christian families, mother and father, praying with their children, reading the scriptures to their children, fasting, no doubt, for their children, and yet, in spite of all that, their children are still going astray. In fact, I heard an account in, I think it was Texas, around 10 years ago, of a Christian family, mother and father, two daughters and a son, and they were a Christian family, doing their best for their children, and as the years went by, the eldest daughter got involved with a bad boy, a devil-possessed boy, who was able to corrupt her, he was able to charm her, he was able to seduce her, so much so that she chose him over her family. And her family, this God-fearing family, like I say, were absolutely horrified that their daughter would be involved with such an evil person. He was able to seduce her, and during their relationship, quote-unquote, she was in her teens, he was able to sleep with her, and she got further and further away from her parents, further and further away from godliness and holiness, and because her parents were continuing to put pressure on her to abandon this individual, they decided to eliminate the problem. And this couple, I would say she was in her teens, and her boyfriend, maybe in his early 20s, decided to murder her parents and her younger sister and brother. And if that wasn't bad enough, they decided to cut them up. They started off by shooting uh, the mother and the father and the younger brother and the sister. And after killing the mother and the younger brother and sister, they decided to cut them up, literally. And that showed you just how uh, quickly sin can step in and literally overtake you. Well, by the grace of God, her father actually survived. He was shot like three times, but survived. Quite remarkable. But his wife didn't, and his son and his youngest daughter did not. Well, the police quickly apprehended this couple, put them on trial, put them before the courts, and they were found guilty. And they both got life without parole. But the father, to his credit, was not only able to forgive his daughter for what she had done, but now makes weekly trips to visit her in jail. He drives a long way to visit her, to speak to her. He has forgiven her. And that really puts things into perspective when it comes to grudges or unforgiveness concerning people like you and I. We can't quite forgive this person or that person. We won't talk to this person or that person. He said this, she said that, and yet, is your grudge anywhere near as serious? Or is your reason anywhere near uh, as serious as what this man experienced? If he was able to forgive his daughter for attempting to kill him, for killing his wife, his son and his daughter, why can't you forgive that person who has wronged you? I'll tell you something, if you don't forgive that person, not only will the Lord not forgive you, 
your sins against him, which means you lose fellowship with him. But on top of that, you will suffer the worst. You will suffer from within. You become bitter. And if you're not careful, that will take over your life. The other reason why we are seeing an increase in this type of behaviour, which maybe 50, 60 years ago was almost unheard of, because we're getting nearer to the Lord's return, obviously. But on top of that, you've also got an increase in internet pornography, computer games, 24-7 television. All these things were pretty much unheard of. 25, 30 years ago, you've got children sitting around watching this stuff and lapping it up. And this is why it's so important to get saved as soon as you can and protect your eyes, protect your ears. But you see, if the parents aren't saved, then of course, what do you expect from the children? If you teach children at school that they came from animals, they will behave like animals, and yet their consciences still convict them. They still know what they are doing is wrong. And yet, as the Word of God says, they've been able to sear their consciences with a hot iron, completely eliminate it, burn it out with a hot iron. Well, I'm seeing an increase in this, like I say, and I'm reading about such uh, wickedness continuing. And of course, we know the devil is behind all of this. Yes, it's true that you've got the world, the flesh, and the devil very much against you. And for some of these people, he has possessed them, completely overtaken them, and he's now able to control them. And for some of these people, they will experience this for all their life. In fact, I was thinking about this a few nights ago. I just wonder if it's possible that when a man or woman, a boy or girl, gets possessed by an unclean spirit, I just wonder if that spirit is able to take that person's physical appearance. You think of uh, ID fraud, you think of uh, stealing someone's uh, name and address, they call that computer fraud, and you pretend to be that person whose identity you have stolen. But I just wonder if it's possible that when somebody becomes possessed, when an unclean spirit enters that person, that somehow they are able to uh, keep that person's physical appearance for themselves. I'm not sure that's possible, but we know that spirits are bodiless, unclean spirits, demons, devils. It's a frightening thought. In fact, if you've ever seen any photographs of so-called ghosts, many a times those people can be identified. Some people have said uh, that they've seen their late uncle or the late mother or the late grandfather. They swear by it and they say that such a person has been able to communicate with them. And of course we know as Bible believers that when a person dies, if they are saved, they go straight to be with the Lord and if they're not saved, they go straight into the ground. So there's no third place. It's not possible to hang around and do your own thing. You either go up or you go down. I was also reading about an account of a Seventh-day Adventist family in America that took it upon themselves to eliminate a problem. And what happened was this SDA woman in her 20s got involved with this guy, who I don't think was SDA, fell pregnant uh, with this guy, or as a result of a union with this guy, and had a child with this guy, and yet realised pretty soon on that they weren't compatible. They rushed in to this relationship. Well, her family, this devout SDA family, decided to eliminate him. And what they did was, they called him to the house where they lived. He had like three generations living in this house. The woman in question, her mother, and her mother. And this guy arrived expecting to see his child, hoping to be reconciled to his estranged wife. Yes, he married her. And yet the moment he walked into the house, the grandmother this devout SDA woman shot him dead, like three bullets in the back of the head. And the police arrived, questioned her, and she showed no remorse whatsoever. And she was put before a judge, found guilty, and got life without parole. 
she was in her 70s when that evil deed took place. And it could be for a number of reasons. First of all, because the SDA are a pseudo-Christian cult. Not a real church, but pseudo-Christians. On top of that, they don't believe in hell. So she probably thought she could get away with it and simply be annihilated upon death. Of course, the term annihilation is a nonsensical term. It's a term which means absolutely nothing. But of course, the SDA, like the JWs, like so many other so-called Christian groups, are false, counterfeit. And that guy was assassinated, literally executed. Well, on top of that awful event, I also heard of something else which was just as deplorable, just as uh, wicked. Let's ambulance go by. Of three teenage students at a college in America, and I'm afraid most of these stories that I'm going to talk about today are from America. America has more access to weapons than any other country in the world. Of course, it's not the weapon that is the problem, you understand, it's those that use it. But these three students in America, uh, two boys and a girl, were in a love triangle. And the youngest of the three, uh, around 17, fell foul of the boy and the girl. The girl was, I think, 19, and her friend was 20, decided to eliminate him. He had fallen out with them. Well, they plotted to lure him in and he went off to meet this girl and they shot him dead. Then they burnt him in fire, literally destroyed his body. And you think, this is terrible, James. Why is the world so sick? Why does this continue to happen? Well, because Satan knows that his time is running out. He knows that mankind is made in the image of God. In spite of what some people say, man is made in the image of God, uh, not in the image of Adam, I might say, but man is made in the image of God. He knows that if he can destroy more people, if he can get back at the Lord in that particular way, that he will somehow uh, get a victory over the Lord. And of course, these people, you have to understand, are not God's people. They're unsaved. They are not his children. So what you've got, in essence, are the goats killing the goats. The tares killing the tares. Satan's children killing Satan's children. Yet, in spite of all that, it still grieves Almighty God. Another event I was reading about uh, involved this 15-year-old boy getting involved with another girl of his age, doing stuff he shouldn't have been doing, like sex. Out of marriage, sleeping around, fornication, drugs, and he also fell foul of his girlfriend and he fell out of favour with his friends and they decided to eliminate him. And they called him to a house, lured him in like the previous child of 17, and they attacked him with baseball bats, shot him, put him in a sleeping bag, and dragged him out into the back garden and threw him on a uh, fire, a literal fire and they took his remains put them in some uh, buckets put some concrete into the buckets and literally threw these buckets over a bridge into a river and his remains have never been found well they too were rounded up by the police given life without parole but here's the truth not only did that boy lose his life, which is terrible, but on top of that, his parents are destroyed as a result of losing their son and are not able to really get any closure because his body, or the remains of his body, have never been found. The assailants that plotted his murder have been arrested and put into jail, and their parents have also been destroyed. They've lost their children. And they may be able to visit them in jail, that's possible, but it won't be the same. You've got a group of people destroying each other in so many ways, and that's sin. That's sin in a nutshell. Sin is contagious. Like I say, you've got Cain, 
eliminating his brother. You've got an account in Judges, chapter 19 of an apostate uh, Levite, eliminating his concubine after throwing her to a group of sodomites to abuse all night. And then he gets his almost dead concubine and chops her up into 12 literal pieces and sends all over Israel. And that almost causes a civil war. That shows you the depravity of mankind. That shows you what people can do. And I put it to you today that that depravity, that wickedness, is in each and every one of us. I don't care who you are. That wickedness is in each and every one of us, saved or unsaved. It makes no difference. The only difference between what this crowd have done and what perhaps you and I will never do is that they actually had the courage, the uh, stupidity, the madness to actually implement what's in their hearts, whereas most people have such thoughts and yet never implement them. But I've just given you a handful of accounts of children killing children, young people killing young people, men and women doing things which, say, 35, 45, 50 years ago were almost unheard of. And of course, we have to understand that today we have, on the one hand, greater knowledge of what goes on around us, like the internet, like social media. You get these copycat people that like to copy others, like a copycat killer or a copycat rapist. On top of that, people have got too much time in their hands. These kids that I've been speaking about in the States, had they been studying, had they been praying, had they been worshipping the Lord in spirit and in truth, this would never have happened. But go back to what I just said. If the parents aren't saved, then what else do you expect? And even if you raise your children in a godly environment, even if you do your best by them, there's no guarantee that they will grow up to be saved. You see, most children, if the truth be known, tell their parents what their parents want to hear. Parents say, uh, well, my son is saved, or my daughter is saved. Praise the Lord. Well, maybe so, maybe not. I'm sure that girl in Texas who assisted her boyfriend to murder her mother and her brother and sister would have told you that she was saved had she been asked. And yet, I don't think she was saved at all. I think she went through the system, went through the motions, told her parents what they wanted to hear. We're living in dark days. We're living in a very complex generation. And this won't get any better. This will get worse. And yet when I go through the channels and I listen to people speaking about revival and your great life is ahead of you and the nations are going to be converted. I think to myself, what world are these people living in? We are at the end of the church age, known as the church of the Laodicea, meaning civil rights, people's rights. We're not in the Philadelphia church. That ended over 100 years ago. We're living right at the end of the church age. And mark my words, things are going to get worse, not better. But I guess if I was to try and pull all these thoughts together and conclude this message, I would say this, that the main reason why people in their droves, in their billions, are going to go to hell is because of this. Men love darkness more than light. They won't come to the light to be reproved. They won't repent. They're going to hang on to their sin. And that's why you're seeing an increase in such depravity like I've been speaking about and will continue to see if you read the news or read the papers and watch the news, if you have any interest in what goes on outside of your own life, that's going to continue. And that's why people are going to miss the boat. They're not going to be saved. And I have to pinch myself every so often to really appreciate that I'm saved. Because when I look at people all around me, when I read about such events and I see people completely hardened, completely cut off, completely lost in their sins, I think to myself, that could have been me. 
So I will say this and conclude that number one, young people are continuing to go astray. They're getting caught up in all sorts of sins and vices which are very addictive. They are very much interested in what their groups say. They want to be accepted by their peers. Their parents, for the most part, are unsaved and therefore can't help them. And even if they are uh, in Christian families, that's no reason to think that they are going to be able to avoid further pitfalls. But I will say this also, that one of the good things that comes out of this terrible subject of wickedness, evil, total depravity, call it what you will, is how some people, maybe one in a hundred, or two in a hundred, or maybe three in a hundred that find themselves in jail, that find themselves being punished for their crimes, some of those people get saved in jail. I think it was uh, Charles Manson, that evil man, and uh, Charles Manson had many people killed, and he worked very closely with his female disciples, a somewhat infamous term, and I think one of his disciples got saved in jail. So it does happen, but by and large, by and large, most people that do such wickedness like murder or rape or child abuse go to jail and never come out. One of the guys that I spoke about who killed this teenager was put for a court in, I think it was Florida, and he was found guilty of first degree murder and he was sentenced to death row. And apparently, according to what I heard, he is the youngest person in America ever, I believe, to have been found guilty of his crime. And he will be given the death penalty eventually. But ask yourself this, was it worth it? I mean, just think about this for a moment. And I'm speaking to unsaved people now. I'm speaking to you. If you are involved with this type of behaviour, is it worth it? You have a period of sin for a season, you enjoy your sin for a season, but when it's over, you've got the shame, you've got the consequences, and you will destroy yourself, you will destroy your family's lives, and your friends, and those all around you. It's not just about you, it's about those all around you, and yet people don't think about this. People are selfish. People want to do what they want to do, and they don't care what the consequences are. Well, I'll say this to you, there are consequences, whether you're saved or unsaved. And I've just given you a snapshot of some of the wickedness that I've been reading about and coming across over recent times. But this is what happens when people don't fear the Lord, don't love him, won't receive him. They go astray, they do wicked things. And when folks turn around and say, uh, where's your God in all this? Ask them, well, where do you expect him to be? Or where do you expect him to be? What do you expect him to do in response to this? You've rejected him. You've turned him down. You've thumbed your nose at him. You've lived in rebellion. What should he do for you? What do you expect him to do for you? You kind of have it both ways. This girl in Texas was raised in a decent family and yet she went astray. She got into some wicked things and as a result is now suffering the consequences. Well, I hope she gets saved in jail. And I know her father, when I've been reading, has been visiting her and no doubt sharing the gospel with her. And I just hope and pray that as a result, she gets saved. I also seem to recall from memory that the father forgave the boyfriend as well. That's remarkable. And ask yourself this one more time that, or consider this, if you will, that if you are holding a grudge, if you can't forgive someone who has wronged you, you should be ashamed of yourself, really, because this person was able to make up with his daughter, clear the air. That's a great picture of grace. If God Almighty can forgive sinners, and he does, if he can save sinners, and he does, if he can pardon you and I, and he has done, why can't you do the same? Why can't you 
humble yourself. Why can't you stop holding that grudge? And above all, if you're not saved, why don't you get saved? I really wish people would understand how important time is. You're here one moment and you're gone the next. But the problem with today's generation is they think it's all the here and now. It's all about the here and now, and of course it's not. And Satan has been able to completely destroy maybe three or four, perhaps five or six generations. And we can't get those generations back. Once they've gone, they've gone. All we can do as saved people is pray for those that we are witnessing to. Share the gospel with them. And then move on to someone else. So I will say this, and I know this has been a somewhat uh, heavy message to speak about today, but the scripture isn't silent on this particular thing. The scripture is very uh, vocal on this particular thing. The word of God tells you what man is capable of and what he is able to do when left to his own devices. And here is the good news. And I began with this and I will conclude with this, that if you want to be saved, if you want to be forgiven, if you want to get free from that particular life, it could be a gang life, it could be uh, doing drugs, it could be uh, having sex out of marriage, it could be all sorts of things, drinking drugs, you name it. If you want freedom from that, if you want to get out of that, this is what you do. You stop what you're doing. Get on your knees. Cry out to the Lord. Open your heart to him. Speak to him like you would speak to your husband or your wife, your son or your daughter. Tell him what's on your heart. Speak to him. Share your inner thoughts with him. And then trust in him. Take him at his word. He said if you come to him, he would save you and he will keep you saved. Start reading your Bible, King James. Read it day and night. Make notes if you can. Meditate on the scripture. Be careful what you see and what you hear. When you get saved, your troubles just begin. When you get saved, your battles are all ahead of you. Never mind this best uh, life now nonsense. When you get saved, you are in a battle and the devil will do what he can to destroy you. He will tie you down with worries, anxieties, distractions, this and that. And if you're not careful, you will never get out of his snare. But if you resist him, the scripture says that he will flee from you. Christ saved you to live for him. He saved you to do great things for him. But it comes down to this, that you've got to fight. You've got to start with yourself and separate from whoever, whatever is negative. Uh, whoever, whatever is not of the Lord. And the more you do that, the more peace you have in your heart, the greater success you have when it comes to eliminating sin. And people will see that you are a changed person and they will want to know what you've got. Believe it or not, people are at the most, or for the most part, in need of what we have. They don't always know how to go about getting it, and sometimes they won't always ask about it for fear of perhaps losing face or looking weak, but people, unsaved people, are very desperate to have what we have as saved people. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again very briefly, that folks pay good money to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist to get help over this or that and yet I was reading a while ago that most of these psychiatrists and psychologists are just as messed up as their patients in fact I was reading not long ago that many of those people shrinks and psychologists are heavy drinkers hooked on narcotics and some even have taken their own lives I guess it's not natural to listen to people offloading on you sharing their deepest thoughts with you you should go to the Lord, confess your sins to him, not to some unsaved man or woman, which will only wear them down. And that is true of the Catholic Church as well. Many Catholics will see their priests and confess some pretty deep things to their priests. And of course that, on the one hand, can result in being blackmailed 
because those priests have got something on you and it can also result in you becoming indebted to such people which also is not a good thing so you've had a slightly longer than usual discussion today looking at wickedness, evil, total depravity examining what people are doing and what people are continuing to do and as I say it's going to get worse not better and yet in spite of that here's the good news one last time that you can be saved you can be set free from it but it means coming to the Lord on his terms not on your own and trusting him to save you and he will save you to the uttermost so I'm going to sign out now and I wish you every blessing every happiness and I hope for some of you this hasn't been too much of a shock to digest but like I say the word of God does speak about this type of behavior in explicit detail you've got rape you've got incest you've got murder you've got every possible sin in the word of God like the first book in the word of God almighty God doesn't shy away from telling you what man is really capable of doing and yet as I say most people thankfully don't uh, play out their fantasies most people don't actually do what's in their heart and that's a great blessing I guess the Holy Ghost must be restraining such people in fact here's a little thing for you to ponder I was reading that around 11% of Muslims are jihadists which I think is around 100,000 worldwide and if that figure is correct you have to ask yourself this why are we not seeing more attacks more uh, jihads why are we not seeing more carnage more uh, terrible events again I guess the Holy Ghost is restraining such people and yet one is too many this is the devil's world this is a fallen world you are born in original sin and that's why this happens and yes God will still judge you for what you do you can't blame him you are responsible for your own actions anyway I said I'll sign out so I will sign out and I wish you every blessing every happiness every peace and joy in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and amen